Welcome back. What I want to do in this video is I want to tell you a little bit about anaplerotic reactions. Anaplerotic, so these are called ana, anaplerotic reactions. And anaplerotic reactions with respect to the TCA cycle really just mean that, that there are certain substrates in the TCA cycle that we can siphon off and use in various biosyntheses. And likewise, if we produce, if we produce one of these um, TCA cycle intermediates in another reaction, we can we can put it back into the TCA cycle, right? Okay. Now, so there, and I'm just going to use several as an example, but essentially the first example that I want to show you is is basically the production of something called oxaloacetate, right? And it turns out that we can actually produce oxaloacetate in, in a particular reaction set, and the oxaloacetate can be put into the TCA cycle. So it's not just that this TCA cycle is just running in a circle all the time. Of course, it is cycling, right? But there are things we can take out of it and things we can put into it. So what I want to do in this, the first thing I want to do is I want to show you this. I want to show you this. So what I'm drawing, you may recognize it. You may recognize it, and this right here is what? It's asparagine, right? This is asparagine. So this is where you get ASN. This is asparagine, right? And it turns out that there's an enzyme called asparaginase. Asparaginase, and essentially what asparaginase does is it uses water and it hydrolyzes off ammonia, right? So the ammonia, this ammonia right here, is essentially this group right here, essentially. And so what you end up with, and let me do this in a blue color, what you end up with is aspartate. You end up with aspartate. So here's the alpha carbon, and here is aspartate. Well, it turns out that aspartate is in equilibrium, in an equilibrium reaction with oxaloacetate. It's in equilibrium with oxaloacetate, and the, the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called, it's called a transaminase. A transaminase. And specifically, in at least in this direction that it's going, it's going, you're essentially going to put in an alpha ketoglutarate, and you're going to get out a glutamate a glutamate. And so what you end up with is obviously oxaloacetate. So you end up with oxalo... oops. Actually, let me do it like this. You end up with oxaloacetate, right? So what does this mean? Well, let's say that I just ate a meal that is filled with amino acids, right? So most likely, I'm probably going to, if, if, I, if I build up the amino acids, I'm probably going to catabolize some of them, and certainly asparagine might be one of them that I'm catabolizing, right? And actually this right here is, you could sort of use an introduction to the, the catabolism, right? This is introduction to the catabolism of amino acids, which we'll do a playlist on that. But asparagine gets catabolized by asparaginase, asparaginase into aspartate. So this is aspartate. And then there's a, there's a specific type of enzyme called a transaminase. And transaminase, specifically what they do, is they, they interconvert between alpha-ketoglutarate and glutamate. And they, what they do is they essentially, they essentially remove an amino group and replace it with a ketone, or they remove the ketone and replace it with an amino group. So this is the amino group right here, right? And so they specifically replaced it with this keto group, right? So essentially, if I were to label the carbons, right, this carbon is the alpha carbon, and this carbon also is the alpha carbon. So that, that's what it corresponds to. So this group right here, this group, this carbon and this carboxy group, are essentially this right here. Okay. So transaminases, they interconvert between alpha keto acids and, and amino acids, right? And transaminases, are, there's a lot of them that you'll find, especially when you get into biochem 2. One thing that's worth mentioning right now is they are pyridoxal phosphate-dependent enzymes. So if I'm going to come down here and draw a pyridoxal phosphate, it's going to look something like, so let me give myself a little bit more room, a little bit more room, make it a little smaller. So they're going to look like this. So it's a fully aromatic ring. 
So you have a methyl group, hydroxy group, you have an aldehyde right here, and you have something that looks like this. So this is pyridoxal phosphate. Let me write that. This is pyridoxal. The al comes from the fact that you have an aldehyde. Pyridoxal phosphate. And pyridoxal phosphate is essentially used as the cofactor that's used to uh, remove the amino group and replace it with the ketone, essentially. So this is, this is essentially a catabolic pathway. This is turning asparagine first into aspartate. And then what you're doing is you're, you're turning it into a TCA cycle intermediate. So what enzyme consumes this? Well, it gets consumed by citrate synthase, right? So we put in a, an acetyl-CoA, right? We put in acetyl-CoA, and of course you get out CoA, right? And actually you also put in a water, right? And what do you get out of it? Well, you get out citrate, right? So what have we just seen in this reaction? Well, this is an anaplerotic reaction. You're, you have some other reaction set on the side, and you catabolize it into something that is an intermediate in the TCA cycle. So this one is oxaloacetate. So the oxaloacetate that we produce ultimately goes into the TCA cycle. So the question then becomes, well, how is it that these amino acids are giving us energy? Well, the, the way they give us energy is by fueling the TCA cycle. So obviously the citrate goes through, and at least at the point that it enters, you end up getting one, you end up getting one FADH2, right? And you get the full three NADHs, right? And of course, you also get one, you get one GTP, right? So this is essentially how amino acids fuel uh, the body if you're catabolizing them. Some of them, at least some of them, will, will, will feed into the TCA cycle, right? And ultimately, that's what produces the energy. So you can catabolize things that will ultimately enter into the TCA cycle. Okay, well let's look at another prime example. And this is an example of something where we're actually taking something out of the TCA cycle. So let me draw alpha ketoglutarate. This is another type of anaplerotic reaction, except it's an instance where we're taking something out. So here's alpha ketoglutarate. It was just produced by what? It was produced by isocitrate dehydrogenase, right? And it turns out that the, the alpha ketoglutarate can react in an ir or excuse me, in a reversible reaction, and it's catalyzed by an enzyme called glutamate dehydrogenase. And actually, let me, let me erase that and put it on the other side. Let's see why I'm doing that in a minute. So glutamate dehydrogenase. And specifically what this enzyme does is it's essentially going to put in, it's going to put in an ammonia, and it's going to get out water. So the water, specifically, if I was to circle this oxygen, the oxygen right here is this oxygen right here. So it's going to put in ammonia, and you're going to get out water. And so this, this by the way, I'll also mention, is an allosteric enzyme. Glutamate dehydrogenase is allosteric. So what have we done? Well, we've taken something out of the TCA cycle, which is alpha ketoglutarate, and we generate something else. So what are we generating? Well, we're generating glutamate. We're generating glutamate, so it's going to look like this, right? So here is L-glutamate. So this ammonia atom right here, this this um, this nitrogen, I should say, this nitrogen is this nitrogen right there. And again, um, so we take something out of the TCA cycle and generate something else. And just to show you even a little bit further where it goes, this will react ultimately with an enzyme called called glutamine, glutamine synthetase. And essentially what glutamine synthetase does is it's going to burn an ATP. It's going to burn an ATP. So we have ATP in here. And essentially what it's going to do is it's going to attach a phosphate, and then ammonia is going to come in and hydrolyze off the phosphate. So what we end up with is ADP. And actually, we're, let, me, let me do it like this. It's going, to, it's going to do it in two steps with an intermediate. And we're going to use ammonia, put in, and get out phosphate. And so what we end up with is glutamine. We end up with glutamine. So it's going to look like this, right? Here's my alpha carbon. Alpha carbon. So here's glutamine. So glutamine, right? And so this, and so if I was to label it, this nitrogen right here, 
is this nitrogen right here. Okay, so what have we seen? Well, and actually, let me let me do one more thing before we actually go into that. There's actually another enzyme that can convert glutamine back to glutamate. It actually has a fairly uh, easy name. It's called glutaminase. Glutaminase. All that does is it takes it off, takes in water and spits off the ammonia, right? And actually, one thing that's worth mentioning is these enzymes are also allosteric. These are also allosteric enzymes. But anyways, what have we seen? Well, it turns out that it, it, if the TCA cycle is running full force, right, if the TCA cycle is running full force, we can take things out of it, take things out of it, and use them for biosynthesis. So it turns out that humans can do this. We can synthesize glutamine in this fashion. And actually, one thing that's important to understand about metabolism in general is that whenever you have lots of low energy charge molecules, and remember that was like ADP, AMP, CoA, um, NAD, th those kind of low energy charge molecules tend to promote catabolism. And remember, the ultimate goal of catabolism is to produce energy, right? To produce ATP, right? And also reduce cofactors. But if I have lots of high energy charge molecules, which probably also means I have lots of TCA cycle intermediates, that tends to promote biosynthesis. And certainly this is a biosynthetic reaction set. I can take alpha ketoglutarate, first turn it into glutamate, and then generate glutamine. Okay? So what is an anaplerotic reaction? Well, they're basically reactions where you can take things out of the TCA cycle and use them for various other reasons. Or, as we saw in this first example, we can essentially uh, break things down into TCA cycle intermediates and then put them into the TCA cycle. And ultimately, that's for the purpose of that's for the purpose of you know um, producing energy ultimately. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on anaplerotic reactions. In fact, before we actually end the video, I might as well mention there this is, these are not the only intermediates that you can take out or put in. Actually, another one that we, we see is succinyl S-CoA. And it turns out that succinyl S-CoA can actually be turned into heme, ultimately. And we'll actually do a video on heme one day. Um, but ultimately, the porphyrin rings are actually formed from succinyl CoA. And actually, there's another example in the urea cycle, and there's an enzyme. I'll, I'll mention it now. We'll, we'll do a whole video on the urea cycle later. But it's called arginino arginosuccinate arginosuccinate lyase and this particular enzyme generates fumarate fumarate and of course the fumarate there can go into the TCA cycle and produce energy um, and but in this case the succinyl CoA gets taken out of the TCA cycle so ultimately what I wanted to show you is that anaplerotic reactions are just reactions where we can take things out of the TCA cycle or break things down and put them in see you soon